Good afternoon and welcome to our event, which is a roundtable on the 2020 election. I'm going to be begin with a land acknowledgement. We take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. My name is Letty Volk and I'm the director of the Center for Race and Gender here at UC Berkeley. I am thrilled to have our outstanding panelists with us to help us think through the 2020 election. Before I briefly introduce them, let me say that we'll be structuring this as a conversation and we encourage everyone to post questions to Q&A during the webinar. And we'll try to ask as many of these questions as possible. So we have in theory, four speakers with us today, although at the moment only two of them are present. We are sure the other two are on their way. Um, and they, the ones that are currently present with us are Teku Lee, Associate Dean and Chair of the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program, and George Johnson Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science. We also have with us Bertrell Ross, Chancellor's Professor of Law and Chair of the Othering and Belonging Institute's Diversity and Democracy Cluster. We also have with us Catherine Fisk, who is the Barbara Nachtrieb Armstrong Professor of Law at UC Berkeley. And we hope that we will shortly be joined by Lisa Garcia Bedoya, who is Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and Dean of the Graduate Division and Professor in the Graduate School of Education. So I'm gonna actually start us off with a question and maybe I can turn um, first to Teku and my question for the three of you and maybe soon to be four of you is, how are you feeling today about the election? Hi, Letty. Uh, thanks so much for inviting us to participate in this discussion about the election. Um, well, you know, I think I feel um, much better than I felt eight days ago, but not as good as I thought I would feel nine days ago. Um, and a little bit uncertain about how I'll feel, you know, over the next two months. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just... Uh, think we are still in this very unusual kind of um, off the equilibrium path moment and at least in our lifetimes in American political history where you know we have as president of the United States somebody who seems to be preternaturally gifted in destroying institutions and norms and um, essentially um, ignoring what you know, have been the rules of the game of electoral competition that we associate with, um, you know, electoral constitutional democracy in the United States. And because he has been so successful at destroying those institutions and those norms and ignoring uh, the general sense of uh, protocol, I think there's a lot that is uncertain about what the next steps are. Um, I would like to think that um, he is sort of licking wounds uh, up to the point where the inevitability of the election outcome really sinks in. Uh, and that then there will then be a sort of peaceful, more regularized transition to power. But, um, you know, he's proven most expectations wrong for the last four years. So that leads to the general sense of, um, you know, anxiety, um, nausea, and uncertainty about what the future will bring. So that's generally how I'm feeling. Can I ask you, Catherine, how you're feeling about the election? Uh, I think Teku said it really well. And I think about 
what the election means, one of the things that we really won't know is uh, what the Senate will be and whether it will be possible for a Biden administration, assuming President Biden does successfully manage to have a transition and get sworn in on January 20th, um, whether he can govern effectively and do the things that people voted for him to do really turns on whether the Senate is going to be willing to compromise with the Democratic president and the Democratic House of Representatives on anything important. We have to remember that in the Obama administration, uh, Mitch McConnell, on behalf of the Senate said that their goal was to make Obama a one-term president by preventing him from governing at all. They didn't succeed in that obviously, but they did make it very hard to use legislation as the tool for implementing policy. President Obama got around that by using executive power. And of course, President Trump has done that to an extreme level. Uh, but you know, for the issues that I have expertise in, which has to do with anything to do with workers and the law of the workplace, yes, of course, regulations matter and there are things that the president can do, but there are really pressing issues that cannot be addressed without legislation. Yeah. Well, this is definitely the case. Um, let me ask Bertrand and then Lisa the same question, which is how are you feeling about the election? Bertrand, you're muted actually. It's been a roller coaster ride since the election. Um, on election day itself, I was actually pleased by the fact that it was a really boring election day in the sense that all of the reports and thoughts of intimidation and violence that might arise with respect to the election didn't come to pass. So that kind of made me feel good about the election. Um, you know, the days after were, of course, angst inducing in terms of not knowing who had won the election. When we had some settlement on who had won the election on Friday, I started to feel a lot more settled myself but then the anxiety has returned. And the anxiety has returned because of the, what I see right now as a concerted effort as um, Teku has described to undermine people's faith in elections, period. And so we went through a period at the beginning of President Trump's term in which we started to have a contestation about facts in which there didn't seem to be any, or the, the domain of agreed upon facts seemed to be narrowing. And now we're having a challenge to agreed upon facts about what happened during an election. And that for the future in terms of not being able to agree about what happened with respect to an election, despite much evidence suggesting what happened, um, really is disconcerting because to the extent that people do not believe that elections are legitimate, no matter how well run, and I'm here to I, I acknowledge that you know there are many problems with the American election system, and I write about many of those in terms of of how it's much too ex exclusionary. But we have always had this sense that when elections decide a winner um, based on the votes that are counted, we will sort of accept those results, and we will continue to put faith in the election for the next election. But if we get to the point where we lose our faith in the election, it's questionable, you know, how sustainable a democracy is in that context. Mm -hmm. And so that's my unsettlement, lack of settlement and anxiety right now in terms of what's the future of this. And what I fear is that this is not just a campaign over these two weeks or, or several weeks before the certification of election results. It'll be a campaign that will, that will continue through the next four years um, until the next major presidential election in which we will refight this battle all over again. And what the consequences of that relitigation of, of the legitimacy of elections will be is something that I just don't know and I worry about. Thanks for sharing your anxieties. It's like each of you speaking makes me more and more anxious. Um, let's hear from you, Lisa. How are you feeling? Uh, ditto to what everyone has said. Also feeling numb and anxious. And I just want to build on Bertrand's point because I think 
Um, you know, my parents were Cuban refugees. I've spent a lot of time studying Latin America, and I, I really, I think, have an understanding of the fragility of democracy and that much of democracy depends on exactly what Patrol was just saying, an acceptance of norms and the belief that your vote is going to be counted. And while I was heartened by, you know, just the images of, um, I think, Joe Gloria, the, the registrar voters for Clark County is my new hero. Um, the fact of people just kind of going through their day-to-day -day work, people counting votes as volunteers and, and just ignoring all of the noise outside was heartening. Um, if people lose that faith, it's a faith that it's very difficult to get back. And so the fact that our political leadership, and, and I really think it's important to say beyond, this is not about Donald Trump. That's the other thing I think I'm trying to process. We tend to focus on him as an individual, but he is reflective of a of a movement within American society that's been building and which I think is part of the resistance toward the changes that came out of the civil rights movement. And so I'm trying to figure out a positive way for us to move forward as a country when um, there was a recent study by Larry Bartels which showed that significant numbers of Republicans don't really support democracy anymore and say, you know, quote, the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast that we may have to use force to save it. Thankfully, none of those threats, as Bertrand pointed out, came to pass, but more than 40% of respondents in his survey agreed that, quote, a time will come when patriotic Americans have to take the law into their own hands. And so that for a non-trivial number of Americans, a multiracial democracy is such an anathema that it would be better to just not have democracy at all. And so that's the place that I think um, helps to explain some of what has been happening and that I'm struggling with because we know President Trump will most likely be evicted from the White House in whatever form that is going to happen. And we know that Joe Biden is going to have to face all, all the things that Catherine uh, talked about in terms of governance. Um, but once you have folks who just don't believe that um, people should have a say if they're not people like them, I think that's a real challenge that all of us as Americans are going to have to face and process um, at, coming out of this election, completely separate from the, you know, the personage and, and symbol of, of Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, let's, if we could dig a little bit uh, into what actually happened on election day as opposed to what's happened since election day in terms of who voted um, what way and why. Uh, could I turn to you and, and have you each tell me uh, what you think about this. So actually, Lisa, I know you've been looking at some of these questions. If I could quickly turn back to you to speak to this question. So I think the first point to make is we keep talking about polarization, but the only ethno racial group that's extremely polarized right now is whites. And I think that's an important thing to emphasize. Latinos are the least, are, are the next most polarized, um, but the split is roughly 70-30. In other words, 70% in, in favor of, of President Trump and 30% against. And among Blacks, it's more of a 85-15 um, kind of a split. And so no group is a monolith. And of course, there's been lots of discussion of the Latino vote. And since that's my specialty, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, you have to remember the Latino community is made up, made up of lots of different national origins, people of different ideologies, generations, folks who were part of the United States when the border shifted, and, and folks who've recently immigrated and everything in between. The polling, Equis Research did tracking polls in different states from 2015 through, I mean, sorry, from um, starting in 2019 through this year. And the polling in Florida had consistently been in the 50s and, and folks knew that there were a lot of undecided voters. So once Joe Biden was determined to be the Democratic candidate, actually the support among Latino voters in those polls went down. So the kind of um, general Democrat versus Trump worked better in the polls or, or did better in the polls than Biden. And so people knew that Biden had work to do in the community and he just didn't do it, frankly. Um, there wasn't the level of outreach. There wasn't the investment in contact. Um, three weeks before the election, he announced his Latino outreach strategy and it was Spanish language ads. And while Spanish language ads are really helpful, the ones that actually he needed to be talking to were the English dominant third, fourth, fifth generation folks. 
That's, and the other thing that happened in Florida that people haven't been talking about is there was a pretty robust disinformation campaign that was carried out through WhatsApp and Facebook. And that was then amplified through the Spanish language of radio media in Miami, which is dominated by uh, Cuban American broadcasters. And so they framed Joe Biden as a socialist. And they also took advantage of the significant levels of anti-Blackness that exist in the Cuban community. And I say this as a Cuban, we, we have the legacies of colonialism like anybody else. And those uh, biases within the community and those fears were taken advantage of in Spanish language media. And it's interesting because Facebook, all the things that Facebook was doing, we can debate whether they were sufficient, um, in English language didn't translate into Spanish. And so this is another place where that media environment was much less controlled, restricted, um, regulated than, than others. And so that's a big part of the story. The last thing I'll say though is in the places where investments happened, in the places where you had organizing on the ground, like Arizona, where people have been working for 10 years to change the politics of Arizona, um, Latino voter, voters voted overwhelmingly uh, for Biden and um, have are the reason why you now have, I call it kind of the, the Southwestern L of blue. Um, if you think about New Mexico, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, California, that's all a product of organizing and, and conversation and political mobilization and Latino community that's come outside of political campaigns and is about the grassroots. And so where those things happened, you had a very different electoral outcome. Who would like to chime in next? Teku. Yeah, um, I, so I, I agree with um, everything that uh, Lisa just shared. Um, that's a lot of the story that I see also. I, I also wanna, I think it's really important to say that if you work backwards from the outcome of the election in terms of who won and who lost, there is just a ton of smoke and mirrors going on right now in the stories that um, I see, you know, prevalent about who voted in what way and, and why. Because I think at the end of the day, it's just a very simple story. And I think the story is that voters of color not only won the election for Biden and Harris, but they won democracy for the country, at least for now. And that a large majority of white Americans uh, were happy to stand behind the incumbent president and were fine voting for a candidate who has authoritarian ambitions and who winks and nods and bullhorns to white nationalists and white supremacists. The, uh, both the mainstream media exit polling data and the election time exit uh, polling work that I do shows you know, about 90% of African-Americans, 70% of Latinx, 68% uh, of Asian Americans, more than 60% of Native Americans, they all voted for Biden-Harris. 56% of uh, white voters voted for Trump. That's the exact same percentage that voted for Trump in 2016. So, you know, when I follow the news, there's a lot of attempts, uh, especially leading up to the election, but also since, that have tried to identify segments of the white electorate that are basically going to save democracy and deliver the election for Biden and Harris, whether it is white women or young whites, whites in suburbs, college educated whites, every single one of those demographic groups voted in the majority for Trump. Um, that is not the story of the outcome of the election. Another narrative that is you know, very prevalent, especially since the election, uh, was about voters of color. It's about how you know Latinx voters that Lisa just talked about, you know, maybe they fell out of line and almost delivered the election to Trump. Except that's not really the story. A lot of that evidence is from Miami Dade, but we lost Florida. A lot of that evidence is from the Rio Grande border counties, but we lost Texas. In terms of winning and losing the election uh, as a whole. In states where Biden-Harris won, Biden-Harris won well above 70% of the Latinx vote at pretty close to the same levels that Latinx voters voted for Clinton Kane in 2016. And it's not that white voters aren't diverse, certainly Latinx voters are diverse. And clearly you can find pockets of the 2020 vote where progressive whites really turned out and did their part to repudiate the Trump presidency. But in terms of winning states or losing states, most of the progressive whites uh, in places where a majority of whites, a majority of young whites, a majority of whites in suburbs, a majority of college educated whites voted for Biden-Harris, those are in states like California and New York, states that weren't 
really in play. So I think at the end of the day, um, in terms of the outcome of the election, it's basically because a coalition of voters of color basically got behind Biden Harris and won the election for him. Patrol, Catherine, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I will um, defer mostly to the um, social scientists on this panel, um, but I will just kind of note that one thing that was interesting in terms of looking at the, the, the turnout numbers is, and it kind of reinforces the point that Lisa and Tay were making, um, you know, what the Biden-Harris ticket saw um, in terms of tick up in turnout were in places like Wayne County, um, mm -hmm. which is housed, which is the county of Detroit, um, also Philadelphia County, um, Philadelphia City. Um, we also saw this in, in parts of Milwaukee in which we had, you know, jumps in turnout. And then of course, Atlanta. And I know we'll talk mm -hmm. about mobilization um, soon, but I think it's the efforts of, and this kind of reinforces Lisa's point, grassroots mobilization efforts that were critical to, um, to this election. Um, and we shouldn't overlook these. I know that there was a barrage of money and ads and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, historically that hasn't been proven to be effective at turning people out. What turns people out is engaging them, right? Mm -hmm. Having conversations with them, explaining to them what the stakes are in this particular election. And it's a grassroots um, efforts in Detroit, in Philadelphia, in Atlanta, in Milwaukee that were just critical um, to turning out this election for this election outcome um, um, that we saw, and, um, and 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 but other parts of it, I, I was surprised, and and I, I you know take his point, you know there was much talk about white suburbanites, uh, suburban women, um, um, you know that would be kind of those would be the game changers, those would be the pivotal voters, but again, what's often overlooked is 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 the efforts by these grassroots organizations and these minority communities um, um, to secure the turnout that was necessary to win this election. Can I ask Catherine, can you tell us something about mobilization? And I'm I want to hear everybody's views about mobilization and suppression and then also to think about whether what you're saying about mobilization and suppression in relation to the election that just happened also bears true for this runoff in Georgia that we're all looking towards. So if I could turn to Catherine to talk about mobilization. One of the challenges I think in mobilization is thinking about which identities to mobilize around. One reason why whites, I think, I'm not a social scientist, so I'm speculating a little about but perhaps one reason why whites are not mobilizing around identity as Democrats is because what used to get them to the polls to support Democrats was labor. Uh, they were members of labor unions that mobilized their identity as workers, as working class. And the thing that Trump has done so well is to build on the decline of the white identity or frankly, anybody's identity as a worker and instead to, in a sense, ricochet off of the mobilization around racial and ethnic identity that has, it would appear been, uh, effective, for example, in Arizona with getting Latinx people of a variety of national origins to mobilize around the way in which their identity has been hurt by unbelievably abusive practices by the Trump administration. You know, Trump was all too happy to mobilize white identity as white and that's not a progressive strategy for, it would appear, for um, whites who aren't motivated by policy. And so you could have college educated whites or young whites who, are, who could be mobilized around particular social policies, economic inequality, um, the massive amounts of risk that workers now face because the social safety net has been so totally eroded. Um, 
but ethnic identity as a mobilization for whites is just not at the moment apparently leading to progressive outcomes. Who else would like to speak to mobilization and or suppression? Well, I, I can throw out more numbers. <laughs> I mean, I think there's no question that the, I mean, what, what we're seeing in terms of record numbers, uh, historic numbers in terms of voter turnout at, at a level that we haven't seen, seen since 1900 is really the product of an incredible amount of political engagement in the American electorate generally. I mean, it, it's kind of a bitter irony, but in a way, I think Donald Trump and his rhetoric and his policies have really reawakened American democracy. So that, I mean, I'll just give you some, some quick numbers here. Uh, typically in the American national election studies, when we ask, you know, if somebody, if a candidate or a campaign has contacted you, has done any outreach with you, uh, you'll get numbers uh, somewhere in the 30 something percent uh, if you are Asian American or Latinx to some number in the 40 something percent range. Um, I think 2018 is where we first got a sense that the numbers were gonna start going through the roof where we started seeing numbers for a midterm election in terms of outreach and contact north of 50%. And in the surveys that I've seen in the 2020 election, it's about 60 to 70% of Americans across different racial and ethnic groups who say that somebody has contacted, somebody has done outreach with them. Uh, in some of the other work that I've done, so I did one project where we just focused in on Georgia's uh, 7th Congressional District, where we Democrats actually flipped a House seat um, and Carolyn Bordeaux won. And I did a survey of Asian Americans in that district, and 40% of the Asian Americans who voted in that, uh, in that district were first-time voters. That's an enormously high number of first time voters and goes uh, to show how strong, especially in the Atlanta area, the Georgia ground game is and gives me some hope for possible success in these two Senate uh, runoff race races. The one other thing I'll say is it's not just around uh, electoral politics. I think, you know, Trump has also, you know, with bitter irony, sort of reawakened, you know, America's spirit of participatory politics outside of elections. So, um, you know, usually in most of these na American national election surveys, you'll get about three, maybe 4% of Americans saying that they participate in protest politics. And Lisa, you can correct me if those numbers are, are off. Uh, I think since Trump has been elected, those numbers have gone, uh, have gone up to the double digits. And in 2020 surveys, roughly one out of seven uh, Americans have said that they have marched in the streets in response to the George Floyd killing and in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Like that is a huge level of appetite for protest politics that I think, you know, I just haven't seen in, in my lifetime. So, you know, the, the voter turnout numbers that we're seeing from last week are sort of a culmination of just a general reawakening in the American electorate. And, you know, unfortunately, it's, 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 it's both on the progressive Democrat side and it's on the more reactionary um, you know, Republican side as well. If I can jump in, um, I just want to say one boring thing. Um, most people don't care about electoral administration, but I do think it's important <laughs> to note that while there were incredible efforts for voter suppression in terms of purging voter rolls, in terms of making it hard for people to register, in terms of um, limiting uh, when mail ballots could come and, and all of those things, so not to minimize the effect of voter suppression, we had an incredible experiment in electoral administration this cycle, which demonstrates the fact that universal mail balloting, in fact, will increase voter turnout. And so it, it is true what Teg was saying that, that this is a unique context and maybe it won't last, but I think the fact that it was so successful and turnout went up so much and that now our, our poor county registrars now are experienced in doing this work, I just think it really <laughs> speaks to how, where California has been leading in terms of changing how we do elections, we should really do this nationwide. Um, the other thing I would say is, is, is to reiterate um, and expand on a little bit what I said earlier. If what we want is an engaged electorate, not only in elections, but also to hold elected officials accountable, that work has to happen through grassroots organizing. And so I think uh, what also happened this cycle is evidence that you know, Black voters matter in Georgia, Lucha in Arizona, Mi Familia Vota across the Southwest, 
these organizations that are doing ongoing between cycle organizing are really having an impact at all levels in state legislatures in congressional districts and in the presidential race and that we can't expect the political parties to provide that sustained investment that we need in order to actually change how especially voters of color um, feel about themselves in the political process and mm -hmm. Uh, if you could only imagine if the billions of dollars that were spent on ads were spent investing in these organizations and paying these canvassers on the ground, we could have a very different kind of politics in the US. That's what I'll say in terms of if you are interested in increasing turnout for the runoff election, uh, just to you know, jump and to um, reinforce uh, Lisa's point, that's who you should contribute your money to. I know the you know, instinct and the ease of giving it to a particular candidate or to a party because they call you up there all the time, they're emailing you all the time. It's, it's those people that aren't emailing you that are on the ground doing the work. And one thing that I found impressive about um, the work, and it kind of comes from Stacey Abrams' um, memo back last year um, that received a lot of skepticism amongst Democratic Party activists in the sense that she was saying the target should be infrequent voters. And we can't just target and treat infrequent voters like we do frequent voters. We can't just show up at their door and tell them to vote. Right, that's just not going to work. We have to treat them like persuasion voters. We have to treat them, give them a sense of of why this matters, why it's why it's important, why it impacts their lives. And I think that that type of strategy and activity had a, a tremendous effect and could have a tremendous effect um, in the runoff elections as well. And just to kind of again build up on, on another of Lisa's points is that you know it seems like if you the more means by which people can vote, it seems the harder it is to suppress the vote. Right, because it's you know there's multiple ways. If you if you're concerned about showing up in person because there might be particular observers there that you feel uncomfortable with, or there are going to be long lines that you're going to have to wait in, then you can vote by mail, or if you can vote early, there are just multiple access points to the ballot that we saw in this election. We saw people take advantage of it um, in ways that um, that boosted turnout um, um, to the highest point that we've seen as Teku points out since 1900. What I fear for the future, however, is that this delegitimization campaign um, with respect to mail-in ballots will continue and will be the basis for making different ways of voting during the pandemic harder. And they'll use justification that we're no longer in a pandemic, so we don't need these means of voting anyway. And, 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 and plus, they're infected with fraud, for which we have no evidence of, of the systematic fraud that they are alleging. But I think that all of these narratives, all of these stories, no matter how baseless that they are, um, if they're told over and over and over again, and there's an echo chamber, there's social media outlets, there's going to be a segment of people that are going to believe them, and there's a party that's going to think it's in their interest to make it harder to vote through these other means. And so part of the battle that's going to be ahead of us for the next four years is combating this misinformation and disinformation beyond these 70 days or however long these shenanigans are going to go on with respect to mail-in balloting and to reinforce the point and show with data how beneficial mail-in voting and other means of convenience voting was to the, to the American democratic project. If our goal is an inclusive democracy, then we need more people to turn out and we meet, need more means of, of voting. And so that's gonna be uh, the challenge I see in the next four years to combat new forms of voter suppression, which are gonna be designed to limit these opportunities um, of access to the ballot. I gotta say, I mean, I'm just thinking of what Lisa said before about the people who want, you know, are expressing a desire for force, right? And when you're talking about, it's not just long lines and like observers, it's like the incredible militarization and gun possession of Americans. I mean, it, you know, that people are relieved that there wasn't murder at the polls, right? So um, just, you know, I'm thinking about that as a kind of form of intimidation of its own, like of its own peculiar American hyper gun possessing variant. Um, but if I could just quickly ask, are there names of organizations working on the ground in Georgia that you would commend to listeners as possible recipients of uh, money? Yeah, so I would say, and Lisa probably has made more, a couple that I'm aware of, the New Georgia Project. Um, there's mm -hmm. also Fair Fight. Um, mm -hmm. There's the Progressive Turnout Project, which has also done some work in Georgia. Those are three organizations that I've been contributing to um, mm -hmm. for, because of their commitment to turning out infrequent voters. Yep. I would just add Black Voters Matter and plus one on all the others. Okay, yep. okay, great.
Um, so Bertrand, you mentioned the shenanigans over the next 70 days. Is there anything, I know you work on um, these questions of election litigation. Is there anything that you think listeners should know about the lawsuits? Um, I guess the one thing I would just kind of, um, you know, give comfort to the listeners or viewers or whatever that there isn't a lawsuit that has any that's out there right now that has any viable chance of overturning the election result. Um, mm -hmm. these, these lawsuits are based on very thin evidence. And even if there were a thicker web of evidence, it was a thicker web of evidence supporting the litigation, they would not actually overturn the results because they're um, contesting either uh, too small a number of ballots to matter, or they're contesting them in states that ultimately might not be pivotal or will probably not be pivotal in the election. And so again, I see this as part of sowing confusion and, and, and distrust um, towards our elections. Um, that seems to be the project. And I see it as kind of part of a long-term goal of, again, using it to justify efforts to make voting harder during the next election, to suggest that because we brought litigation without any factual basis, despite the fact that they were dismissed, the fact that we just brought litigation and we said there was fraud and we said it over and over and again is enough to justify a campaign to make voting harder. And so again, there's, there's nothing really, um, I've been following this litigation quite closely and I've been you know, searching and searching for something that would raise questions about the election um, and how they were conducted and, and there's nothing. And what's been remarkable is how well the elections were run right, how well the elections were run, given the mm -hmm. situation, given that these states had to adjust on the fly to a new way of running elections, right, they weren't perfect, don't get me wrong, they weren't perfect, but they were remarkably well conducted, and there hasn't been really any evidence of fraud. Is there any sign of, of lawyers or law firms backing away from bringing these? I mean, I've been looking at George Conway's Twitter feed, and the sort of attempt to shame Jones Day or yeah. mm -hmm. other law firms. I know, Catherine, you think a lot about legal ethics. Like, are, are there, you know, cracks that can be uh, mined here in, in terms of these questions? What about Rule 11 sanctions? Like, aren't these frivolous yeah. cases? I mean, we are seeing some law firms back away. Jones Day having a little bit of, of discomfort with respect to Jones Day, Day lawyers having some discomfort with it. We had a major firm in Arizona who ultimately just decided to, um, to um, step away from the matter that they were representing the Trump campaign on, which had to do with Sharpie Gate or the, the use of different types of ways of, of filling in your ballot with a Sharpie pen that you know the, the Trump campaign suggested was the basis for overvoting or undervoting or whatnot. So the firm seeing that this litigation didn't really have a prominent basis ultimately stepped away and is not supporting the effort anymore. We've had a lot of sort of concern in the Department of Justice with the memo that was issued by William Barr this past week suggesting that the DOJ mm -hmm. can be involved or should be involved in investigating fraud before the certification of election results. The prior practice was to wait till after results were certified before you started investigating fraud for fear of implicating and embroiling the Department of Justice in, in a partisan dispute because the Department of Justice is not supposed to be a partisan actor. But William Barr has shifted away from that and that has created, created a lot of controversy within the Department of Just, Justice among civil servants who are um, on the front lines and lawyering in that, in, that, um, in that agency. So there's a lot of discomfort that's been expressed. Um, I think people are going along with it ultimately um, to humor Trump, to humor um, the, um, his supporters. Um, they feel that there's no harm in just going forward knowing that it won't change the election results. But I think it's tremendously harmful. It could be tremendously um, impactful on our democracy. Does anybody want to jump in here? Well, I just don't yeah. understand. I just don't understand. Um, they won't win, according to you know Bertrand and, and Catherine. And and based on Trump's past record, they probably won't get paid either. So I just don't understand. I don't understand what what the game is here. <laughs> Well, I was just going to add, it's weak. It's to weaken Biden. It's not just about humoring him, right? It, it means he goes into the office and, and they'll continue these accusations and it just delegitimizes his administration. 
Speaking of, what do you think can be accomplished under these conditions in a Biden-Harris administration? And I mean, I, I think back to sort of the toughest moments of the Obama administration of just like facing these constant onslaughts. You know, of course, there's also the question of who's going to control the Senate. Um, but what do you, I mean, if you had a crystal ball, what do you think could happen in terms of like areas that you care about, like policy, uh, different changes that you would like to see? Anybody? I mean, I don't know. I, I can jump in. Lisa, do you want to jump in? Well, I was just going to say, so the optimistic ideas, even if um, the Democrats don't control the Senate, is that because Biden has these long-term relationships on the Hill, that he will be able to, you know, this may be a moment where having an insider is helpful, right? That he may be able to walk that line in the Senate and find enough senators to support um, his program. I think uh, he's made a commitment to immigration reform in, in the first hundred days. On the good news side, what happened when the Gang of Eight bill was, was ended up not being taken up by the House, the, the pro-immigration rights community actually really focused on building its relationships on the Hill and the Senate. And so that foundation remains and they've spent the intervening years gaining uh, relationships in the House. And so I think there's a possibility where the combination of, of Biden's long-term relationships and his ability to maybe cash in on some political capital and the fact that the, at least on the immigration side, the activists have really been working to build those alliances in the interim with enough people that they may be able to circumvent uh, Majority Leader McConnell, but but it, it, it really is up to whether or not Mitch McConnell wants to do the same thing as Catherine said that he did with Obama, right? That whether he decides to just obstruct or whether um, there's a desire to at least have some things go through co Congress in the next four years. I'm, I mean, I'm also, when you look at the Biden-Harris platform on immigration, like there's a whole list of things that uh, he says he would do in the first hundred days. And it's primarily executive actions around undoing things that Trump did. But um, the Migration Policy Institute has come up with a report of 400 policy changes the Trump administration has made and basically mm -hmm. says these could be reversed, but it's going to take this kind of rapid fire action, which I fear the Democrats are like more careful, right? They want to be more consultative. They want to be more bipartisan, right? And that there's not going to be the, you know, just think about like the, the rapidity with which Trump appointed judges compared to Obama, right? It's like, I really worry to the extent that, that the pace and the political will, like, you know, what will be there, you know, with constantly looking to like, well, can we get reelected, right? So other thoughts on this, Keiko, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I think to that point, um, it would be a mistake to be too aggressive to try to affect change through executive orders because that is almost certainly going to kind of poke the Republican Party's kind of litigious bear and wind up, um, at least in the public's eyes, having the early part of the Biden-Harris administration spent a lot of time trying to fight um, these efforts to uh, affect change through executive order. And I think Biden actually has um, the potential to try to move the needle by using kind of soft power uh, tools and resources. And what I mean by that is, I, I think actually the country does, is hungering on both sides for greater decency, greater regularity, greater normalcy to our politics and there are things that Biden could probably do um, just in terms of um, kind of using the bully pulpit of the presidency to set a very different tone that could uh, that could gain him greater political capital. So I think I think decency is one thing that should be uh, on his uh, agenda in the early days of his presidency. Regaining some sense of standing in the world is another thing that I think is sort of a soft power resource that Biden uh, could use. And it's it's not anything that I think um, the majority of the people who voted for Biden and Harris, uh, it's not gonna be on the top of their list, but I think because it's not really on the top of their list, but it is something that I think political elites, even a lot of Republicans really care deeply about the harm done to America's standing in the world. I think that's something that Biden uh, could work on. 
The third thing that I think Biden could work on and is working on is some semblance of a coordinated uh, federal um, response to the COVID pandemic, uh, which I assume will both have a public health, health component and an economic component. Um, and then the last thing that I, I think that Biden uh, could make headway towards, which could build um, uh, not only um, policy successes, but could eat into the, the base that Trump has built around him is to really recognize the fact that there is a lot of um, there's a lot of pain in um, parts of white America today, especially rural parts uh, of white America and majority white communities that essentially have been abandoned by the 21st century global economy. Um, when you look at some of the work that the economists uh, Ann Case and Angus Deaton and others have done about the kind of um, epidemic rise in mortality and morbidity among white Americans where mortality and morbidity have morbidity rates have been going down in basically every OECD country. You know, they call them, you know, deaths of despair. So there's just been huge increases in, you know, deaths by suicide, deaths by poisoning. And the, you know, the, op the opioid epidemic is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. I think that gives Biden Harris an opportunity to try to push for policies that can bring in Republicans and that can um, give some Trump supporters a reason to think that they are actually addressing um, issues of concern to them. Now, I think all of this is to say, like this is none of what I mentioned are going to be on the top of the list of the most intense Biden Harris supporters. So it could actually, um, you know. Um, weaken the enthusiasm behind uh, Biden's base. But I think these are things that that um, that are opportunities for Biden Harris in this in this current political environment. Now, if you wind up winning the two Georgia runoff Senate races, then it's a different ballgame. And there's many other things that you could think about. doing. There are also issues that the Republicans floated didn't do anything about, obviously, as Teku points out, pandemic relief. Um, the unemployment extensions are going to expire on December 31st, and that is going to be catastrophic unless magically a whole ton of people go back to work, and they're not going to. So I think there will be opportunities to, as Biden says, build back better for unemployment benefits, for example, for workers who are designated as independent contractors. Uh, remember at one point, people in the Trump administration, including Melania Trump, whose holiday card, by the way, this year says that it's the last Trump Christmas in the White House. Is that a concession? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, in seriousness, um, there was some support for paid family leave at the federal level, which um, I think Biden could pick up on. Lots of states had enacted uh, workers' rights stuff, including in states that were red. For example, Florida increased the state minimum wage to $15 an hour. And this is not the only state that was that voted red. There are solid red states that have increased local minimum wages even while voting Republicans into office. And so I think there is potential for some carefully chosen legislation, regardless of what happens in the Georgia runoff elections, because there are a lot of whites whose, um, as Teku points out, whose communities have been devastated. So can we bring manufacturing jobs back to the US in a huge way? No, but could we do a lot more about job relief or some kind of economic support for people who can't leave the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, but there are no jobs left in the Upper Peninsula? Like, what are you gonna do with those people? And so I think that is also an opportunity to pair economic support 
in communities of color in the counties that were solidly blue, Wayne County, as Bertrand points out, with economic support in areas that were Trump supporting and make that an issue about class, not an issue about um, you know, religion or race or something that's potentially more divisive. Y'all are so much more optimistic than I am. And I think that the, what Catherine laid out and, and take and Lisa laid out are just rational policy making that you might see in a functioning bipartisan system. What I fear though, is that every Republican is gonna be looking over their shoulder at Trump. And they're gonna be fearing being disloyal to Trump. And Trump started his Save America PAC. Well, in order to have that pack make any sense, there has to be something to save. And so what I fear is that Republican obstructionism is going to reach new heights over the next four years so that American carnage can arise. And so that, you know, if Trump or one of his acolytes decides to run, they can run on the same platform that they ran on in 2016 same platform they ran on in 2020. And that's much less effective if we're, you know, if we're prosperous, if things are going well, if, you know, things are functioning. And so I think that there are built in political incentives to continue the dysfunction we're seeing in our democracy by the Repub for the Republicans. And I, I, I just don't know if anything gets done if those two runoff elections don't go to Democrats' way, Democrats' way. Bertrand, you've just sunk me to lower lows. <laughs> oh my it's funny, God. I was on the panel with Lisa the other week and I was the optimist and now I, I, I've kind of gone the other way. I don't know. It's, I'm a little bit moody right now. Sorry. Yeah. Oh man. Um, so we're going to move to some Q&A uh, audience. Q&A, there's a really interesting question I want to read um, from the audience, but um, I encourage other people who are listening to submit questions and then also uh, you four can think about questions you've been dying to ask each other. Um, so this is from uh, Dara Tom, who says, um, following up on something that Teku said way, oh, way ways back, uh, I hope we don't lose sight of the historic nature of Kamala Harris. Did we need to experience a Trump presidency to get a multi-ethnic female in the White House? I guess maybe I'll extend Bertrand's pessimism. I guess I would frame the question a little differently. I think we got Trump because of Obama, right? Trump was the response to having a black president. And I can imagine given what we know about Mitch McConnell meeting with his people to make Obama a one-term president, I'm sure they're having a similar conversation about how to make sure Kamala Harris does not become, mm. right? People know Biden is probably only going to be there for one term. How do we make sure that the Democrats don't stay in office for 12 years, right, um, as a possibility? So I think that the, the one thing that I, I you know, I, I appreciate what everyone has said, and I agree with it, but I, I do think the part I'm still processing about this election is that 72 million people voted in favor of sustaining white supremacy doesn't mean that they're racist, right? So, I, I you know, racism is at the individual level. We're talking about supporting a system of social stratification that the president, that President Trump very clearly um, not only supported, but believed in and, and governed from. And so I think that is a core issue that is going to be underlying all of these different sort of political machinations that are going to happen over the course of the next four years. And having a, you know, a, a a black woman or a South Asian woman or however we want to talk about Kamala, a multiracial woman um, as vice president, I think is, is going to keep that um, bubbling to the top. And unfortunately, I think Trump will continue to leverage people's fears in order to continue um, having people support him. Wow. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to add. <laughs> I'm laughing at the next I, question. Yeah. I was like, people want to think about 2024. I just want to take a nap. Oh yeah, so, so, uh, so can I, can I just, I, I just feel like I, so I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. I also think at the same time, um, you know, you get a bunch of academics together and we're always going to be able to 
you know, pick nits and, and find, you know, uh, talk at length about worst case scenarios. But I, I think it's worth celebrating um, where we've come, like how far we've come and some of the sentiment behind the, the, the you know, the questioner's uh, curiosity about Kamala Harris, which is that, you know, I think 20, we, we should celebrate the fact that in 2020, we didn't go through a vice presidential selection process where we had a white guy who felt like they needed to diversify the candidate pool for the sake of diversifying the candidate pool. But we actually had a presumptive nominee, uh, you know, from one of the country's two major parties who said, I am, I am going to pick a woman. And then uh, it became pretty clear that his primary focus was going to probably be picking an African American woman. And then it became pretty clear that this wasn't a, oh my gosh, who are we going to pick situation, but that there was just a wealth and a depth to the number of incredibly, you know, capable candidates, you know, any of whom Biden could have picked and done really well with. So I, I think that is, you know, well worth celebrating in spite of all the other, you know, reasons to be uh, cynical and cautious about where we are. So two really interesting questions have come in that I'm hoping you four might answer in the next four minutes. <laughs> Question one from Tracy Aerosmith, who will be the next Republican front runner in 2024? And from Andrew Facciano, how do you feel about Biden focusing his support toward left-leaning policies and working with the coalition of supporters he gained during the election? I mean, I'll answer the first question um, and then try to think about the second one. But I think that um, Donald Trump is a, is a leader of the Republican Party and he will be the leader of the Republican Party until he's not, he chooses not to be the leader of the Republican Party. He has such um, a connection with a base of voters um, um, and who um, 72 million of them came out to support him and, you know, the, the things he stood for um, that Lisa so um, articulately described. Um, and so he will either be the front runner or will decide who the front runner is. And I think that he, he's the person you have to look to. Um, Biden focusing his support, support towards the left, I'll, I'll let others answer that. So not to take up too much airspace. I, I can't resist the opportunity to say that a lot of the people who whose names people might bring up as the Republican front runner for 2024 are probably people that didn't fully game out their loyalty to Trump. And by which I mean to say, a lot of them probably thought that Trump would be a one term presidency and they would be lined up to be the presumptive, you know, front runner for the Republican nomination in 2024. And they hadn't probably planned on such a razor thin election or 93% of Republicans, you know, voting for Trump and Trump essentially retaining, you know, uh, control of the Republican Party or rather continuing to hold the Republican Party hostage and that they would, as Bertrand said, constantly have to look over their shoulders to see if they were, you know, uh, pleasing Donald Trump. So um, they probably, people like Pence, people like Pompeo, uh, you know, uh, people like Ben Sass, they probably didn't gain this outright. Lisa, Catherine, any final words in our last two minutes? I guess maybe I'll, I'll touch on, I'm not quite sure um, what the left-leaning uh, part is. And I, cause I, I just feel the need to say most advanced industrialized countries manage to provide healthcare for their population. <laughs> like that's not a radical concept in most of the world. Um, so just to say, I think he'll, he is a centrist. He will govern from the center. Um, but the kinds of things that he's advocating are actually things that most, in most places, people just take for granted. Yeah. And actually, before I bring in Catherine, uh, we just did get two more questions. So maybe this will be the final word. So Jose Luis Bedoya saying, who should replace Kamala in California? And then I think our final thing, each of you should say very briefly something uplifting. The, what are the antidotes to fear and distrust? from your perspectives, what can we do to start coming together? So if people wanna to respond to Jose's question about replacing Kamala, the Biden left question for Catherine, if she wants to speak to, and then antidotes to fear and distress. So let me start with Catherine. 
I'm going to be an optimist on this. And I think I'm going to push back a little bit against Lisa's point about the 72 million people who voted for Trump voting for white supremacy. Of course, it all depends on what you mean by white supremacy. But when I hear white supremacy, perhaps that's coming as a white person, I think of the Ku Klux Klan and avowedly racist policies. Academics don't tend to mean that. They mean something else. Um, but what I would say is that the country that voted for Barack Obama twice is the same country that elected Donald Trump and where there are a significant number of people, obviously, who voted for him. I'm not sure that I am as pessimistic about the possibilities for a multiracial coalition I think I read the Trump presidency the way that California had paroxysms of anti-immigrant sentiment in the 90s as reflected in Proposition 187. And then Californians or white Californians or whoever you want to talk about, longstanding Californians got over the effect of immigration. And now the state is fairly blue, although capable of voting conservative things. So I think going forward, it's the issues and the economic issues and the serious economic problems we have that have the capacity to uh, prompt a real um, inclusive and egalitarian but somewhat centrist political governing coalition, including in 2024. Okay, so I'm going to give everybody 30 seconds. Teku, Lisa, Bertrall. Go ahead. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a society in which a majority group, which for 230 some years has held monopoly control over power and privilege has peacefully ceded that power and privilege. And we're in the middle of seeing a struggle over whether that power and privilege can be more equally shared across all groups. And it's going to look like all hell is breaking loose when you're in the middle of that period of change. But that's the, that's the period that we're in right now. Lisa? I think the positive story from this election is the degree to which in communities where people got together, talked to one another, worked on the things that they care about, that they were able to change their local government, their prosecuting attorney, their district attorneys, state legislatures, and their vote for the presidency. So I think um, the power of grassroots organizing was really uplifted in this election. Bertrand? I guess what I'll say is what I, what I think works in marriage, um, reach out and presume good faith in each other. And <laughs> that could take us a long ways towards creating a sense of understanding that would allow us to move forward in this democratic project. What a beautiful note to end on. Thank you for so much. That was fantastic. This is our last event for this season. We hope to see you at our events this spring. Everybody take care, be in good health, be well. Bye. Bye.